In the last video, we covered how to enter the internal loads in the um, IDF editor. In this video, we're going to talk about the envelope. And uh, if you go to your simulation input summary, or the input-output summary, um, I have divided these model inputs into, let me zoom in here, internal loads, people, lights, equipment, process, and hot water. That's what we've already done. And then envelope loads which includes the climate, orientation, geometry, context shade, exterior shade, interior shade, windows, walls, floors, ceilings, mass, and infiltration. Now, that seems like a lot, but actually we've done a whole bunch of this already. We've, we've already input the geometry using Legacy Open Studio. We've already input the context shade. Um, the climate is going to be very simple. The orientation is already set. Uh, so really, the, the main things that we have to cover here are about um, materials and constructions. So let me uh, walk you through that. And before I go any further, actually, uh, I meant to do this in the last video and I forgot. It's a good idea to periodically run a simulation and see how it goes uh, to make sure that you haven't um, created any um, errors before you get too far. And so... I'd say every two or three saves as you save through, it's a good idea to try it. So let me show you how to, um, how to run a uh, simulation. So I've got this finished geometry uh, file, 04, and actually I should save this as um, 05 internal loads. So that's what we've entered so far, .idf. And I'm going to go to EP Launch, if you remember this guy, and I'm going to browse to that file, Internal Loads. And for the, so, so this dialog box is going to um, help us to simulate this using NG Plus Thermal Simulation Engine. It also wants a weather file as an input, so you can browse to your EPW file. In this case, I'm going to use the Oakland International Airport as the closest file to Berkeley. And that's really it. And then press simulate down here. And as this simulates, you'll see you get a dialog box opens and it goes through every month of the year. In this case, it's a very simple model, so it's going very quickly. Um, I expect yours might take a little bit more time, although you probably are using faster computer than mine. So on the whole, it should take anywhere between 10 and 30 seconds. For very large models, it can take up to 20 minutes or so to do uh, one of these simulations, but these are not large models. So it's also extremely important when you get this dialog box to read it carefully and make sure that it ran as you expected it to run. So it tells you the two input files here, the internal loads.idf and the weather file. And then it says run complete, energy, com energy plus completed successfully, one warning, zero severe errors. Lapse time, 12 seconds. So the first thing you should do is jump for joy because you have zero severe errors. That's wonderful, and it's cause for celebration. Um, the one warning is something to uh, look out for, and well, any number of warnings. And I'll show you how to check what the warnings are. So I'm going to press OK to get rid of that dialog box. And then this uh, uh, EP launch um, interface will then populate the results down here and probably as a default it looks like this um, with the sets tab open but if you go to all you can see all of these and this errors button is the one that you want to look at in order to see what your warnings or severe errors are so what this says is and by the way these are usually written in pretty good English so if you read it, try, try reading it and see what you can tell from it. Sometimes it's hard to know. And if you've got uh, questions, feel free to email either me or Luis. So um, what this says is uh, the version and then testing the branch integrity, all branches passed, testing individual supply error. Remember, this is a a z mixed air zone model, so it's making sure that it finds a volume of air. Um, all supply air paths uh, passed, 
Um, all return error pass pass. No node connection errors were found. Woohoo! And then it's beginning the simulation. And the warning we're getting here is determine polygon overlap. Too many figures greater than 15,000 detected in overlap calculation. Use the output diagnostics display extra warnings for more details. So um, if I wanted to, or if you wanted to, go and figure out more about this error, you could um, uh, Google it. You could go to the Unmet Hours um, website and look up for help. Or you could look in the input output reference for uh, help on that. These are the, the three best ways of looking at errors. Most of the time, Google searches don't come up very well. Um, you can also troubleshoot this through Energy Plus by using this output diagnostics display extra warnings. Now, this is a, a common thing to get when you have a lot of shading. Um, uh, a lot of a lot of uh, context shade. And in this case, we've got a lot of louvers on our Worcester Hall model that are overlapping, and that's why we're getting the, the error. And this should run okay, even even with this error. So it also says here there are 18 unused schedules in the input. That's fine. It just means all those extra schedules for uh, schools, offices, residential. Uh, and hotel are not being used. Um, you can also use the output diagnostics display on new schedules to see them if you want. Um, and then it gives you a summary of your warnings and errors. So this is good. One warning is fine. Probably you'll also get another warning that says that your um, your weather data was taken at a place uh, that it didn't expect or something to that effect. And that's also going to be fine because as you run it with different um, different weather, it's going to um, the, the the program won't know exactly where it is until you run the the climate file, and that's fine. It it still works just fine. Um, so generally speaking, the warnings are not um, super critical, as in it won't cause your results to fail. If you get a severe error, though, it will look like it sometimes will look like the the um, the run ran successfully, uh, but a severe error means that it didn't. So you can't trust those results. Okay, uh, another thing I wanted to mention about errors. Errors are your friends. Errors are like a trusted advisor coming back and saying, "Hey, look, you you probably input this wrong." And I want to underline that this is something you should look forward to, not. Uh, something you should dread, because what it's what it is, it's like someone trying to help you out, and you should think of it that way. If you just returned a severe error um, and it failed without knowing why, that's kind of useless. But having this um, tell you what's going on and and how to start to think about correcting it is really really helpful, and it's actually one of the few good simulation programs that does this well. Okay, so now we've got a few other tabs here, and the, the two the important ones that we're going to use in this class are this tables and variables. The tables file will open an Excel file with uh, a summary of all of your uh, inputs and outputs. And what I'd like you to do is copy this using this um, A1 sort of corner copy key, and then Control C, and then going to your dashboard and in the table tab copying this file right in there and that will update this end use summary in fact that is the only thing that is linked to that table file is this end use summary you can see here there's also a variables file uh, uh, tab and the um, there's a also coincidentally a variables results here, and these variables results are are the more detailed results from the run, and you can see that there's 8,760 rows with with one header, so 8,760, 8,770, 8,761 rows. 
and I want to copy those to my dashboard in the variables. And when I do that, all of the other spreadsheets will update. So the year spreadsheet, the week spreadsheet, the renewable spreadsheet, the energy use spreadsheet are all tied to that and, and the viz panel are all tied to the variables. So variables and table are the two inputs that you need to copy in. And really, I'd like you to look at some of the variables and sort of inspect them as you go this week. But the key one for this week is going to be this table file. Because we're going to be using this end use summary to, um, to do a comparison of, of different schemes relatively quickly. Um, something else I should note, and this is also true in previous versions of the templates I've given you, make sure that the yellow highlighted text matches the text next to it. So this end uses by subcategory should match this. And heating, cooling, lighting, and equipment should match heating, cooling, lighting, and equipment. If these don't match, then probably you pasted the wrong thing into the table or you um, somehow screwed up the run. So try it again uh, if they don't match. Um, it's also possible that you may have messed up something in the dashboard itself, in which case it might be a good idea to re-download the, the dashboard from the class folder and try it again. Um, but all of this is kind of programmed with a um, formula. You can see the formula is up here to try to make sure that um, that, that the correct the correct values for um, electricity, cooling, and heating are populated right in this row or column right here. When you do get this column here, when that's populated, you can press Control C. And it says it right here. Copy this column to the bottom of the input output summary. Go to the input output summary, and down here, if they if say this is my baseline run, you can copy it. Now, again, it's important to copy with your with the um, uh, but copy the values only, not the formula. So right click, and then this values um, w will this will or at least it should. Um, populate this graph. I think the reason that it's not populating it is because in this formula down here, it's looking for a value that we haven't entered. So if I go up to the top, yeah, it's dividing by the analysis zone um, area, and we haven't entered that in this spreadsheet. In my example, it's entered. So I'm going to put here 149 as my analysis zone area, and now and now it uh, populates the um, end uses for this baseline case. So as we change the case um, and copy new files into the table tab, then the end use will update. You can copy this over to the input output summary and go on your merry way. Now that we've got the um, a sense of how to do a simulation and incorporate it into the input output summary. Let's keep going with the um, enclosure systems. And I'm going to go back to my um, uh, my IDF file and I'm going to save this as 0, 06 um, constructions. And I'm going to show you how to input or think about constructions. So you can see that there is this um, class right here called construction. And this gives a series of different constructions that are named by this, um, the, the, this overall name. And then inside each of these constructions is a series of layers. So it starts with the outside layer, which in the case of the exterior wall is concrete. And then goes to a middle layer and an inside layer. And you can actually add, theoretically, as many layers as you want. But for this um, exercise, I've got a very specific way that I'd like you to do this. Um, and the, the way to do this, the way to um, think about it, I've got a few slides here to, to help you.
The basic way to conceptualize this is uh, like this diagram here. It's almost like a sandwich or an Oreo cookie where you have two sides, the, the bread on both sides, and then a filling in the middle. And uh, this is an exterior wall, floor, or roof. And for energy modeling, particularly for thermal si simulation, there's really two characteristics that make the most difference. One is how insulative the wall is, how resistant to heat flow. And the second is how much thermal mass there is, how, how much energy it can store, and whether that energy or whether that mass is exposed to the interior or exterior environment. And so uh, the way that I've conceptualized this as the sandwich is there's a layer of thermal mass, a layer of insulation, and then a layer, another layer of thermal mass. And any of these could be adjusted infinitely. So you could have a one millimeter thick bit of thermal mass if you essentially have none. Or you could model a realistic thickness. And um, perhaps if I give you an example of a real building envelope, this would be more clear. On the left, I've got a, a typical residential building envelope. Uh, you see from the inside out, so here's this, the wood studs. This is a layer of sheetrock or gypsum board or plaster. This is a layer of fiberglass bat insulation. This is a layer of rigid insulation. There's a vented air gap, and then there's uh, lapped siding. In this version, it's very similar with wood studs, interior sheetrock, exterior insulation, and um, air gap, but now there's also this building lath and then um, some stone, like a stone veneer put on, on the outside. Now, in both of these cases, you can conceptualize the assembly like this. There's mass of some sort, in this case very little mass, in this case probably a little bit more mass. There's, in this case, two layers of insulation. There's the rigid insulation and then there's the stud uh, cavity insulation. And then there's interior mass, which is sheetrock, which is also not a huge amount, but, but, not, but, but uh, more significant than you might think. And so if I analyze that, I can sort of make my sandwich here with mass, insulation, mass. And if I can figure out the total effective thickness for this insulation, I can simplify the whole assembly to this on the right. Or, or this, um, which is that you've got a certain amount of mass, a certain thickness of mass on the outside, a certain thickness of insulation in the middle, and a certain thickness of the mass on the outside. And similar to this other assembly, there's, got a, there's a different thickness of mass on the outside, a thickness of insulation, and a thickness of mass on the inside. So the natural question is, how much thickness should we um, estimate? And for that, I've got in the model inputs calculator a uh, handy chart here to help you. And this is called the equivalent insulation thickness. This means that if, if in this, let's just say that all of this insulation, rigid insulation and fiberglass insulation, is all fiberglass insulation. If um, that fiberglass insulation has less R value than the rigid insulation. So this one and a half inches of rigid insulation is the equivalent of about three inches of bat insulation. And the bat insulation that's in the stud cavity is, you see it's a two by six uh, wood frame, so that's actually five and a half inches of bat insulation, but every 16 inches, or sorry, every 24 inches there's a stud, so there's no bat in that area. And that comes out to about 10% less insulation on total, between 10 and 20%, depending on how you count it. So let's just use 20% for a second. If I had uh, five and a half inches and I had 20% less, then I would end up with four and a half inches of insulation. I hope that makes sense. Um, please puzzle over that for a little bit. You can see I've got some thermal bridge assemblies. So like that two by six wood stud at 24 inches 
would be would have um, a US R value, an IP R value of 15.4, or an SI R value of 2.71. But the equivalent thickness in inches would be 4.8 inches or 122 millimeters rather than the full five and a half inches or what's the equivalent five and a half inches in millimeters is sorry I can't do this in my head uh, about 200 millimeters I think okay um, so that's that and then if you had the continuous insulation like you're seeing here there's this continuous insulation on the outside we can add that to it. So if this is one inch of XPS styrofoam, then uh, we would have an additional one and a half inches of bat insulation. So we can add these together. The total assembly would be um, 4.8 plus 1.5 would be, what is that, 6.3, um, 6.3 three um, inches equivalent bat insulation. Um, and if you need more help or need more materials, I've listed a bunch of very common materials here. If you need more materials, um, this is a database of lots of different insulation and finish materials and you can see what the R value is. I've got it in IP units as well as SI units. Um, and uh, you'll see in a second why I've done it this this way in Energy Plus. So coming back here, you see that we've got um, concrete insulation and concrete. Now, if I wanted to model that um, this wall with effectively what did I say it was 6.4 inches, I can't remember. Let's just say 6.4 inches of um, let's say 200 millimeters of insulation here, then I need to change this insulation to 200 millimeters. And if I look at this drop-down menu, I've got 100 millimeters or 300, but 200 isn't listed there. So let me show you how to make your own um, material. And of course, the, the materials are listed in a different um, class. You can see right here, there's 11 materials defined in this file. And I've just quickly defined oh, a set of concrete and a set of insulations. And the insulation, by the way, I should, I should mention, is um, using this conductivity here, watts per meter Kelvin. Um, and this is the conductivity of bat fiberglass bat insulation. So if I wanted 200 millimeters of it, I could copy this insulation 300. So I'm going to duplicate object there and rename it to insulation 200 millimeters and then change the thickness to 0.2 like that. Then I need to go back to the construction, go to insulation, and now you'll see that that insulation 200 millimeters is there. Um, something else I want to point out here, if you pick an insulation or you, you could even manually type, well, let's just do it this way. If you pick an insulation that is deleted, so say I then I delete my 200 millimeters, and I go here, you'll see that this turns peach or pink. And as we talked about earlier, that um, pink represents a value that is um, not referenced, so or the reference is missing. So this is bad. You'll get an error if you uh, run this simulation. So make sure that that is... Um, that you're selecting something that is actually in the list or make it yourself from the materials. Now, for um, this example, we've got the insulation figured out here between the rigid and the bat insulation. And we've got this exterior and interior mass. And in both of these cases, it's very minimal mass. I'd say both of these are somewhere around half an inch, which is... Uh, what is that, about one and a half millimeters or so. And, no, sorry, 15 millimeters or so. Um, and so I could include here a mass construction that is 15 millimeters. There it is, on both the inside 
and the outside. And although it's sheetrock in the example here, let me pull this over to the side, although this is sheetrock on the inside and it is cement board siding on the outside, they're close enough in density to concrete that I'm not going to change it for the, these runs. This is a very coarse way of doing this, but it's a fast and uh, for the purposes of this model, it's accurate enough. Um, so please use this con concrete insulation concrete sandwich and, um, and let me know if you have any questions during class. Now we've got, um, so that's true for your floor, your wall, your interior wall, your exterior roof. Actually, I should talk about the interior wall for a second. We're not modeling interior walls geometrically in any of the, um, these models because we're going to, uh, this is going to be a, a one zone model and, um, and the interior walls are not going to be there. However, there is a class further down called internal mass. You can see it right here. And that internal mass is linked to the construction name interior wall. So if you have interior walls inside your zone, the way to input the mass is through this object here. So going back to our constructions, um, we've got two more constructions here, exterior window and exterior window interior shade. And I'm going to explain first about the exterior window and then I'll talk about the shade. The exterior window is referencing this 3A glazing double clear low E air aluminum. And you can find all of the window materials here in window material simple glazing system. And I've got here a set of materials. I got 23 total windows um, for you. And those, um, those correspond to windows that are in your input model inputs calculator. So if you go to glass, um, this is a set of very common glass assemblies. And we'll talk more about this in class, but there's three th frame types. So aluminum frame, thermally broken aluminum, and wood or fiberglass. They're very similar wooden for fiberglass frame. And then there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different glass types inside those frames. And here I've got the center of glass values. VLT is the visible light transmittance. SHGC is the solar heat gain coefficient. Then U value is a measure of thermal transfer in SI units and in IP units. And the, um, that is just for the glass with no frame. Over here you see the same values and these values are for the glass plus the frame. And so these are the values that I'd like you to use, or they're actually already input into the energy plus materials. So this is a, a nice way of finding it. Say you have an aluminum, say it's like Worcester room 214. I have an aluminum window with single clear. So that's got a U value of uh, 1.3 or 7.39 SI and it's got a visible light transmittance of 0.66 and a solar heat gain coefficient of 0.66. So if I go into my file here, you can see that 1A is called glazing single clear aluminum and it's got a U factor of 7, a uh, solar heat gain of 0.66 and a visible light transmittance of 0.66. And so all of these correspond to that chart. So in your construction, you should uh, select the glazing type, the window type, that ma best matches your building. You may not have a perfect match, but um, it, this, this will get you close enough. For the interior shades, if you've got interior shades, so in Worcester we have these, in the computer lab, we have these Venetian blinds, these aluminum Venetian blinds. I've got two shades that I've set up in the, the model, and you can find them on right here, there's a window material shade, and there's a window material blind. So the blind is like a Venetian blind, and the shade is like a fabric shade. This fabric shade is, is a light colored shade. It has quite a bit of um, solar, um, solar reflectance, so it's light in color, as well as visible reflectance. And the blind is a 
uh, medium reflectivity slat, similar to what we've got here in Worcester. And um, what you need to do is quite simply select one or the other or none. If you've got none, then um, you can, let's see, what's the best way of doing this? You could, um, you know what, if you've got none, leave it as it is and I'll show you how to control them so that there's, so that they um, don't work. But um, if you have the slats, then you pick the slats. If you've got something similar to shades, then you pick the interior shade. And I'm going to turn this back to slats so I don't forget. And then this, um, the, this is going to be the window without the shades, and this is the window with the shades. And this is um, a very interesting thing about, and it's a window into how Energy Plus works. It um, uses a schedule to control when it would be this assembly and when it would be this assembly. And you can kind of help, uh, you can define that schedule. You see down here it says window property shading control. And the interior shade control is um, linked to the shading type interior blind. If I had shades, I'd want to link it to interior shade, like that. Um, you notice that it also, uh, sorry, I just said the same thing twice. If you, you have blinds, you want to link it to interior blind, like that. And what's going on, and you see that it's linked to the construction with shading type exterior window interior shade, uh, because that is this name right here, exterior window interior shade. So you don't need to change that uh, name. In fact, don't change it because it will mess up the dependencies. And how the shade works is it's being controlled effectively by how much solar radiation is on the window. This is the proxy for saying that if there's a lot of sun on the window, people are going to close the shades. And so what the simulation software is doing is saying that if there's more than 350 watts per square meter of radiation on the shade or on the window, then it will change state and the shade will be deployed or it will use the window assembly with the shade built in. And so that's the way this is working. If you wanted to change this to um, be off, then you change the schedule name to always off. There's, it's that simple. Now when, when it goes to look for the, the shade, it won't be there or it won't have availability. And, um, and that's the easiest way of defining it. The uh, other thing you have to be aware of is as you make windows geometrically, they will uh, be defined in this file. So actually I should show you the fenestration surface detailed. These are all of the windows that I've got in the file. Remember when we made the geometry originally, we made six windows on the west side and three on the north. So this should be nine total windows. And this um, shading control name is linked to that shading control object we just looked at. So it says interior shade control. Um, and if you look at the shading control here, this says interior shade control. So if you make a new window, you must, if you want to control shades, go through and, um, and um, it will, by default, look like this. And you need to add the shade control to that window. Um, I guess another way of doing this, before I said you can change the shade control to um, always on or always off, you could also just uh, make this cell blank, not blank, but blank, like that. And now there would be no shade control for that window. The last two parts of the um, envelope system are airflow, infiltration, and ventilation. And you can see these two objects here, zone infiltration, zone ventilation. Actually, there's a third one called zone ventilation, wind and stack open area. Uh, so we're going to talk about these three classes right now. The infiltration class is very simple. It gives the name of the object, the zone is applied to, the schedule, which we're going to have always on, um, and the design flow rate calculation. 
In this case, let's just everybody use air changes per hour, which is a pretty easy concept to understand. It, it basically means that if you think of the total volume of space, um, that is um, equal to one air change. So that um, if all of the air is replaced, that is an air change. So how often does that air change happen? That is a measure of volumetric airflow. And so what infiltration is looking at is through all the cracks and leaks and little um, places where air can come and go, um, how often is the interior volume of air replaced? And in a very efficient building, a, a sort of a well-built building that's tightly sealed, you can get as low as about 0.1 air change per hour. More typical modern construction is somewhere around 0.3 uh, air changes per hour. Usually you see commercial construction is a little bit tighter than residential. It also depends a lot on the local building culture and where in the world you are. In um, places that have less um, conditioning, particularly less heating, it's more common to see more leaky envelopes. So for instance, um, here on the West Coast, we have much more leaky envelopes than we do on the East Coast where you get colder temperatures. The, uh, this, this building, Worcester Hall, has uh, very leaky envelopes. You can feel it, uh, the air infiltrating in through, particularly through the um, windows. And so I've set here an air change rate of one air change per hour. That's, that's pretty leaky. And so we're getting a lot of unwanted air in um, both cold and hot, and you'll see dramatic impacts. Now, ventilation is just like infiltration, but it's controlled airflow. And so it works exactly the same way, except that there's a lot more control associated with it. And there's different ways of doing it. The code, in most codes around the world, um, mandate a certain amount of fresh air per person or per area of a building. And um, these codes are more strictly enforced for commercial buildings than for residential by and large. But uh, you see here there are three objects. And let's look first at this one. This is zone ventilation per person. So what it says is for zone one, it's going to be always on. And their design flow rate method or calculation method is going to be flow per person. So you see here, the, this number, 0 0.014 cubic meters per second per person. As people come and go, the ventilation will ramp on and off, almost as if it's on an occupancy sensor, or most likely in real buildings, um, it is tied to a carbon dioxide sensor. And so as carbon dioxide levels get higher, then more ventilation air will come on. That um, is an idealized system, but it's one I'd like you to use for this. Another way of thinking about this in a residential setting is that if it starts to get stuffy inside, people will tend to open the windows to let in more air. And so that's another way of thinking about this. Now, in this particular uh, setup, we're controlling this not with windows, but with a fan. And that is this ventilation type is a, an intake ventilation fan. And you see here the fan efficiency is at 60% and the fan pressurize is at 500 pascals. Now the fan pressurize is something you can customize. I'd like you to keep the fan efficiency at 0.6. The fan pressurize ha has to do with um, how long the ducts are in the building and how many turns they have, how much pressure is basically built up between the interior and exterior because that is pressure that the fan has to overcome in order to be effective and it impacts energy use. In the model inputs calculator under fan, there are some basic rules of thumb. So for a central mechanical ventilation system with heat recovery, you get a fan pressure drop of about 1500 pascals. Uh, for a local ventilation unit within a room, like a, a laundry room, um, you get about 300 pascals. And so if you're not sure, then 500 pascals, which I've got here as a default, is, is a good, um, a, a good uh, number to default to. But uh, it can be 
almost double this, or a little bit more than double this, if you've got a centralized ducted uh, fan system. Now, and so that's that's um, the extent of my uh, my occupancy-based ventilation fan. I've got another ventilation fan that is ventilation by area. So what this means is that this is going to be always on no matter what the occupancy is. And you can see that this is actually a much smaller number than this one is, 0 0.001 cubic meters per second per square meter. And notice also the calculation method is different. This is per person and this is per area. So this is always going to be on no matter what. And again, you can set the fan pressure rise in a similar way. And there's one last one in this, um, in this class called exhaust ventilation. And right now I've got this off as a default. And this is set to air changes per hour. So this is a different way of thinking about ventilation. And, um, and what this is is sort of like a purge ventilator. It's uh, sometimes known as a whole house fan, or in um, large commercial buildings, it can be known as an economizer cycle. But that, what this is, is taking outside air and, um, and delivering it into the building and exhausting hot air. So it's an exhaust type ventilation system. And five air changes per hour is quite a lot of air. That's going to um, really get rid of, um, well, essentially every what is that, uh, 12 minutes or so, it's going to completely um, take out all of the air in the building. And, uh, and so this is um, the, the exhaust ventilation. This exhaust ventilation here is set to not just, um, so there's a schedule here, and if I turn this always on, then this will always be on, except that this has a really nice thermostat built in. And the thermostat says uh, we'll give any number of different components here. You can set a minimum indoor temperature, a maximum indoor temperature, um, a different, a delta temperature. So the, the delta between the indoor and outdoor, you always want, for instance, you don't, if you want to cool the place off, but it's hotter outside than inside, you don't want to have that ventilation system on. It's not going to help you. It's going to replace cooler air with hotter air. So you want to make sure that there's a positive delta between interior and exterior. Also, it, you can set maximum and minimum outdoor temperature limits. So if it's really cold outside or really hot outside, you could um, say, I don't want that air in, no matter how bad it is inside. Um, and it also allows you to set a maximum wind speed, which would um, be uh, potentially problematic if, say, you have, uh, well, in this case, 40 meters per second would be hurricane winds, but uh, you could also set it to be a lower threshold so papers aren't blowing inside the building, things like that. We're not going to worry too much about these inputs, but this 22 degrees and 28 degrees are critical because um, it could conflict with your thermostat set points. So if you have a uh, exhaust fan set for 22 degrees, but your heat turns on when it's below 24 degrees, then you're going to be heating uh, the air and then exhausting it. And so you'll see your heating bills go way, way, way up or your heating energy. And the same on the uh, high side. If you set this to be too um, high, then your cooling um, energy will go way up. So it's, it's important to, to recognize what these set points are relative to your thermostat set points. We're going to talk about thermostat set points in the next tutorial about mechanical systems. So one more class here I want to cover, which is zone ventilation, uh, wind and stack open area. And um, as I've said a few times, Energy Plus is a mixed air model. So it assumes that all air in the system has mixed thoroughly and you've got um, this sort of volume of air. But what it doesn't do, therefore, is calculate stratification or um, or, or pressure differential within the, um, within the zone. It calculates pressure on the zone from outside, um, but that is a much more detailed calculation we're not going to get into in this class. It's called uh, airflow network. So 
this is a simplified method here of accounting for natural ventilation. It is very straightforward and it goes directly, if you look up here, these formulas here for uh, cross ventilation and stack ventilation are exactly the textbook formulas and uh, very easy to understand. I'll, I'll explain them in class. But um, all it's looking at is the opening area to your building or to the zone and uh, schedule and the wind speed. So that um, the wind speed is given by the climate data and the opening area you need to give it. And you also need to give it an orientation. So I've set up here south, west, east, north, and stack ventilation <clears throat> objects. It comes with five. And you should input the uh, free area, so the area of window that can be open to the outside, um, and um, input it here for each orientation. And then uh, change the effective angle to the orientation of your building. So I think my building is or, or Worcester is 12 degrees off, so I would change this to uh, 12 north and um, 102 east and 282 west and 192 south. Um, and just like we saw with the... Right now, these are... Um, actually, they're not all set to always off. I've got the west on and the north on in this example file. Um, so in, in Worcester Hall, we've got west windows and north windows. We don't have south or east windows, and we don't have any stack effect going on. So I've turned those all off. Now for the west windows, we've got 18 square meters of free area, more or less, and um, the effective angle of 282 degrees. The um, minimum and maximum indoor temperature I've set to be a very narrow band between 23 and 25 degrees. And again, this goes back to exactly what I was just saying about the ventilation fan. It has a similar type of thermostat setting. So the, the theory here being that I would open these windows if it was between 23 and 25 degrees. If it's below 23 degrees, I'm not going to open them because the heat's going to be on. And if, I, if it's above 25, I'm not going to open them because the cooling will be on. Now, you can calibrate this with your cooling system and say, like, Worcester Hall has no cooling system. So I could set a very high thermostat set point for my cooling system to, say, 40 degrees centigrade, and then I can uh, increase this to, say, 30 degrees, and um, they won't conflict with each other. Okay, so that covers ventilation. We've now gone through the constructions, the assemblies, glazing, shading, interior shades, infiltration, ventilation. Um, so we covered all the envelope and in the next tutorial we'll cover the mechanical systems.